going to be your tour guide today, and we have a fantastic show coming up. But before we start our show, I want to remind you, like I always do, safety is our number one rule. So if you're going to handle a live firearm today, please make sure it's unloaded. Matter of fact, if you have a live or loaded firearm, my recommendation is you put it somewhere else. Now, of course, if you're armed, keep that firearm in your holster or slung. We're talking about rifle today. We're actually going to have a fantastic guest, Mr. Joe Farewell, a buddy of mine top three gun shooter, top instructor. This guy travels all over the place and teaches the top of the top how to shoot rifles and handguns much better. He has his own dry fire program, former law enforcement officer, great guy overall, fantastic. High energy, you're gonna love it. We're breaking down everything that you want or need to know about structure with a rifle or a carbine. How do you mount it? Where does the stock go? Where should your hand placements be? Talk about pressure, all of these things to maximize your ability to shoot a carbine or rifle with lots of speed and combined accuracy. Trust me, you're gonna love it. Also, I uh, wanna remind you, we have the Live Fire Weekly Programming. So if you are on Live Fire, do me a favor, give me a follow, right? Follow me, send me a message and I will follow you back. You get to see all of my programming, all the things I'm doing and practice on a regular basis. The Live Fire drills, uh, and speaking of drills, we release a weekly programming drill. Basically, it's a systematic series of drills that started weeks ago, and every one of these drills build upon each other. So if you're not following the live fire programming, you should. It's really good. Right now, it's handgun focused, but trust me, it's uh, great content. You're going to love it. In addition to the Joe Farewell Show, we have a great company we wanna showcase, Primary Arms. They sent me some really cool optics and they're making some stuff that's gonna blow your mind. I really like this company. So with no more delay, let's get Primary on the line. Thank you very much for having us on and we, we always appreciate talking to you guys. So I'm glad we were able to get all our kind of technical difficulties figured out there, but um, yeah, we love being here. We appreciate it. Oh, well, we're happy to have you. So tell me a little bit about Primary Arms and uh, an overview as a company and then maybe let's focus on some of the optics that you sent me or some of the other things you guys have that you're, you got going on. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, we're Primary Arms Optics. I'm the director of product marketing for Primary Arms Optics. We have a few divisions of our company. Uh, a lot of people know us um, for our kind of e-com side, which is uh, the primaryarms.com side. Um, but I myself am with the optics team. So all of the like micro prisms that are out there, our GLX and PLX line, our SLXs, uh, that's that's what we do, and we we do most of the design work. We do all the developing. We do all of that stuff right here in Houston, Texas, um, and it's you know, we've been on the scene for what have we been making optics for about twelve years now, and over the last I'd say three to four years, we've really started focusing on higher end um, performance, but maintaining that really good value to the customer. So. Um, we've seen things like our new PLX compacts come out, which is one of the shortest and the lightest LPVO on the market right now. Uh, we've got our micro prism series and a 1X, 3X, and then we have a new 5X this year, which is it takes that, you know, prism optic. So you're getting a magnified glass etched reticle uh, in a super tiny footprint that doesn't add any more weight to your gun. Very versatile, kind of a dual, super rugged optic. Um, and then things like our new SLX 1 to 6 with the new Nova reticle, which has been a just huge success. Um, people have loved it. It's a fiber wire illumination. So it's, I kind of joke around with it that it's it's like getting LASIK every time you look through the thing because it's so bright. But um, it, it gives customers that red dot bright that they're looking for, which is um, really how we try to develop products and run the business is we listen to customers, we hear what they want, and we try to cram as many features in to give them that you know, we all know that there's no one perfect gun and there is no one perfect optic either, but we try to give them that unicorn that they're looking for, at least as close as we can get to it. Give the viewers a, maybe um, a quick definition of here, this is a micro prism, you know, compared to maybe a traditional one power wide open red dot, you know. What are the differences? Tell us the features and benefits of the optic like this. Yeah, sure. So with uh, with a traditional red dot, like this guy right here, um, this is our MD25, which is a traditional reflected LED red dot. Um, with this, you have a an emitter 
a reflective lens and you have your ocular lens. So the emitter is shining light onto the reflective lens and shooting it back to the to the shooter. So that's what you're seeing is that emitter. You're kind of restricted on what you can do as far as reticle patterns um, and things like that because you are using just the emitter itself. With new emitter technology that's out there, we've been able to um, kind of do shapes and things like our ACSS version of the MB25. Um, but a lot of people have a problem seeing the dots in these because they have an astigmatism. So if you look through a traditional red dot, like your aim point, like um, some of the EOTechs that are out there, um, even sometimes our MD25s, and you see kind of a great cluster or a smear that it just doesn't look like a sharp defined aiming point, it's because of an astigmatism. And unfortunately, that tends to be exacerbated when you use a traditional red dot style optic. But with mm. something or micro prisms, like this guy here. Um, so this is our 3X, but we also do it in a 1X. And then, like I said, it's a, we have our 5X now as well this year. Uh, this is a prism optic. So it's an etched reticle, just like your one to sixes, just like your two and a half to tens, your three to nine old hunting scopes. You have that etched reticle. So you always have a very sharp defined aiming point. Um, and with illumination, you can run it just like a dot, especially that 1X, the illumination is extremely bright. So with illumination turned on, you can run it like a dot. Now, different than a traditional red dot where once that your battery source dies or you have an electrical problem or something like that, if that dot goes away, you're looking through an empty tube. So you need backup iron sights. With a prism, because that reticle is etched into the optic itself, if your illumination goes away, it doesn't matter. You still have a black etched reticle in there as an aiming point. So it gets rid of the need for backup iron sights altogether. Like as long as you can see through the optic, you can engage with it with precision fire. Yeah, and the light bulb just went on when you made that statement. That makes complete sense. And when I, the, one of the things I notice about the one power is, is the definition of the actual you know, the, the reticle itself. Now, the when you say ACSS, is that defined specifically by the triangle shape or does it include the outer ring? And can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so um, the ACSS system is a system of reticles that is unique to primary arms optics. Uh, we actually have 36 active ACSS reticles, I believe, in all the optics that we make. Um, but some of the key features in the ACSS are that um, kind of center aiming chevron. A lot of people recognize us for that. Uh, it gives you an infinitely precise aiming point at the center. And also the dimensions of that chevron, depending on the reticle that it's used in, uh, can be used to range targets as kind of a, a small BDC, things like that. Um, a horseshoe, that's another kind of defining characteristic, characteristic excuse me, of the ACSS. Um, that horseshoe is designed to pull the shooter's eye to the center. Because a human eye likes to center circles in circles. So mm -hmm. it gives you um, kind of subconsciously in your brain, it helps you center that reticle up to the target that you're on. Um, and then there's also other features that can be found in some of the other ones. Um, so in the 1X microprism, we have what's called the Cyclops, and that's a very simple version of the ACSS, just a chevron and horseshoe. Uh, it's also got some ranging bars at the bottom that you can use on either an 18-inch wide target, so something like a IDPA or USPSA silhouette, um, or you can use it uh, for a full height target. So if you have your IDPA is mounted at 5'10", which is what most of the target backers are, or um, you know, five foot ten average height. You can actually range uh, that target based on that height. So, if if I am a consumer and I'm looking at the three by prism or the one by prism, how would you guide my selection? I'm going to buy a primary arms optic, and I'm and I'm trying to figure out which one to buy, and I'm certain it has to be based on purpose. But how would you guide me? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, usually when people ask a question like that, my first question back to them is, what do you want this gun to be? What kind of tool do you want it to be? You want it to be a sledgehammer for just knocking stuff down real quick, or do you want it to be, um, you know, something that you can reach out and do a little bit of engagement with? If you're looking at the 1X versus the 3X, um, the question would be, do you want this just as a general purpose rifle? Um, you know, you're going to do some close engagement, some far engagement. In that case, I would tend to lean towards the 3X, especially if you're shooting a caliber like 5.56 or maybe 308, um, because we've got BDC specific for 5.56 and 308. We also have a mill variant of as well if you're shooting something different. And we 
also have a 762 variant so if you're shooting like subsonic 300 blackout as drops in for that but that 3x will give you a little bit more distance distance capability as well as um target ID capability just because of that 3x magnification package but 3x mm -hmm. isn't so much magnification that you can't also shoot two eyes open up close with it but it's kind of a good balance between the two if you want something with just absolutely the widest field of view possible um, a true 1x you can shoot both eyes open with almost a heads-up display for say you're putting it on a um, an SBR 10.5 kind of um, home defense gun or a truck gun or something like that, that you're going to be engaging close and fast with, then I'd recommend leaning towards that 1X um, just for that that 1X, two eyes open, heads up shooting ability. Yeah, and we'll, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, LPVO optic, but if I were to run the one by a prism, can I run a magnifier behind it? The change based on a normal red dot? Uh, you sure can. So a lot of the 1X prisms that are out there on the market from some of our competitors, you can't run a magnifier with them because you start stacking eye relief on top of eye relief. But like you've got that 1X in the studio there with you. If you take it and you put it at about four inch eye relief where it would normally sit, and then you stretch your arm all the way out and just follow that reticle out, you'll see that the eye box on that thing is about four feet long. So you can mount it way far out. We've oh, yeah. modified that optical system so you can slam things real close to it so you can actually use it with our three by micro magnifier um, so if you want that best of both worlds so not necessarily a dedicated three or a dedicated one you can run it with a magnifier and and have both options yeah see i didn't even mean to set you up for success on that question but it, it did anyway <laughs> man, good stuff so all right so tell me about this bad that. boy and one of the things that um in one of the pre-show conversations uh, one of you all, we were on the phone, said, you know, it's a, a variable optic, but it's got well, at least one of the models, maybe a newer model, is very daytime bright, which means, which I, I hear and like, I can have that at one power and be at what we may call CQB distances. Maybe it's my home defense rifle or whatever else, but then I can crank it up for identification, maybe for hunting, maybe it's my ranch rifle as well. As well. So t tell me about these guys and your variants. So yeah, this is, um, these are like the one you have there. This is one of our new generation four SLX one to six second focal planes. Um, so it's a one to six variable LPVO um, in our SLX line. So very budget conscious, but this is the new gen four, which we just came out with this year. It's got an upgraded optical package in it, um, upgraded turrets over the gen three, but one of the big things we did is we um, offered a new set of reticles within these. So we've got the Auroras, the ACSS Auroras, which are BDC based. Uh, we do it in 5.56 five, in both yards and meters for distance. And then we also do a 7.62 yard based, uh, if you're running like that 300 blackout or 7.62.39. Um, but one of the ones we're most excited about and one of the ones that have been most popular for us is the new ACSS Nova. So like I said before, it's that fiber wire illumination so where most of the etched reticles use what's called an etch and fill. So you use a fill in the reticle etching itself, and then you reflect light off that, kind of like reflecting headlights off of a stop sign. Um, you're losing a certain amount of light off of that etch and fill. So they can be bright um, and they can be daylight bright. So you will be able to see the red in daylight, but they're not going to be that super intense, like red dot bright. Now with the ACSS Nova, it is that super intense red dot, mm. right? So you can back this thing down to one power, shoot it with both eyes open, just like you would shoot our 1X micro prism, just like you would shoot our um, MD25 standard dots. Um, but it does give you that capability and a little bit more information in the reticle where you can crank it up to six. And then you have um, our auto ranging, so that 18 inch wide target auto ranging system again. And you also have mill stadia dropping down. So you can figure out what your drops are. And at six X, you can engage to targets pretty far out there. I mean, a lot of people think you need super high power for, you know, four, five, 600 yard targets. 6X is more than enough to get you out to 600. Yeah, I think the Nova is the one that I'm waiting to show up in the mail because I don't have the Nova yet right now. We're working on it. I actually just got word from the warehouse that that dream may come true, so. <laughs> love it, man. Well, I love the products. Um, do you all make all of your stuff in-house in Houston or are you just based in Houston, you have them made wherever? 
Uh, yeah, so we are actually standing up U.S. manufacturing right now. Uh, so in the optics industry, U.S. manufacturing is um, difficult. There really aren't a lot of places that do it, um, and we are standing that up. It's not in any of the stuff that we currently offer. There's some kind of cool secret squirrel projects that we're working on that will be coming very soon. People will hear more about them very soon. Um, but yeah, right now we work with manufacturing partners overseas. We do engineering design work in in-house. I've got a team of engineers literally right across the hall, some of the smartest guys I've ever met that do our mechanical engineering, our design engineering, our, uh, um, yeah, pretty much everything for the optic itself. They optimize the optical systems. Um, we draw and design the reticles. We do all that stuff here in-house. I work with our manufacturing partners overseas and um, you know, just like a lot of other guys in the industry, we, depending on the series and depending on what scope it is, we get some stuff out of Japan, some stuff out of the Philippines and a little bit of stuff out of China. So it all kind of depends on that, that price point and feature set, um, who we use to, to help manufacture. Yeah. Well, I love it, man. I'm, I'm excited. You've actually said a few things, uh, that that's it, educated me on some of the optics and I'm super excited to get both the one power. And I think I'm going to run the three on one of my rifles. Uh, and get out there and uh, shoot a bunch with them and, and, and test them out. So look like great products. You know, I can say from just picking them up out of the box, the out of box experience is great. They're heavyweight, they look tough. They look Mike Seeklander proof, which means I break and drop things on a regular basis. So I'm super, like, uh, su super excited to shoot them and test them out, man. So tell us uh, any new news the primary wants to share and where people could find you on social where they can buy some of the optics or check out some of the optics on your website yeah 100 so um you know we're, we're in dealers all across the country so go to your favorite optics dealer there's a good chance they they have it in there um and if they don't tell them they need to carry it they uh they can call me and we'll get it figured out um Otherwise, you can go to primaryarms.com. That's our e-com site. We sell everything from everybody on there. So feel free to check out and browse around, look for whatever you need, uh, as well as all of our optics. You can actually search if you have a favorite reticle, like the ACSS Raptor or the Griff Mill or anything specific you're looking for. You can search specifically by those reticles um, through our website. Uh, to learn more about the scopes, hit up primaryarmsoptics.com. It's got all the breakdowns of our scopes and reticles in there. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we're all over the place uh, at Primary Arms. And uh, yeah, you'll see us there. Feel free to reach out to us. Uh, if I don't reach out back to you, it's one of the guys from our marketing or social team. They'll get back to you. But it's always a real person. You don't have to worry about a, a bot asking you to find the never ending bus or anything like that. It's it's super easy to get a hold of us and we love talking to people. So. Yeah, or crosswalks or bicycles. I yeah. trust me, I know. How many cars All right, are folks, there you have it. Up. Stephen Morgan with Primary Arms talking about the optics. From what I've seen, they're fantastic optics and uh, at an affordable price. Check them out. Give them a follow on Instagram, Facebook, social. Check out their website. And uh, Stephen, thank you so much for jumping on the show today, man. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Mike. You guys take it easy. All right, so folks, hopefully you love those optics. They're really cool optics. And here's some exciting news. You can actually win one. We didn't realize this, but they're going to do a giveaway for our Live Fire users. And that's all you have to do. You've got to download the Live Fire app. You've got to be on Live Fire. You've got to go to the social feed and you've got to make a social post. Tell us anything you want to tell us. Show us a picture of your carry gun. Um, uh, record a drill. Do a drill. Uh, put a note up there how you're going to use Live Fire to improve. Doesn't matter. Whatever. Hashtag primary arms. We're going to look at all of those posts, right? And uh, we're going to select a winner. You get a free optic. And by the way, they're super nice optics and they're pretty pricey as well. So if you want to win a free optic, get on the Live Fire app, app and do that, okay? All right, folks. So transitioning into Mr. Joe Farewell. Joe Farewell is a fantastic three gun shooter, top level tactical instructor, teaches all the who's who kind of entities out there, a friend of mine, really skilled, really high energy, and we're talking about all of the cool things you need to know about structure. Uh, mounting a rifle or carbine for maximum speed and accuracy, pressure, position, stock length, all of that stuff. Uh, so let's get Mr. Joe Farewell on the show. So when we got Joe on the show, we asked him to share a little bit about his journey, a little bit more about his bio that I didn't initially cover, and this is what he told us. Mike, thank you for having me on, brother. I'm stoked to be here. 
So I started out actually uh, in shooting just with nothing to do with law enforcement. I, my shooting started, you know, young, plinking in the backyard. We had a range here always and then got into competitions when I was maybe 20 years old. And then um, after that, I got into law enforcement. So I was shooting pistol competitions already uh, before I got into law enforcement. When I got into law enforcement, started a local agency and um, quickly progressed through that. I had a lot of fun with it, did all the fun things that I wanted to do, became an instructor, did the SWAT thing and the task forces and uh, primarily worked narcotics and gangs um, for the most for most of my career. Uh, and then left that in 2018 to go pursue competition and training full-time. So I, I found the passion for teaching other people how to shoot better. Uh, I found a way to make a living doing that. And now that is what I get to do. I've, I've done all the fun things on the, the law enforcement side that I wanted to do. They were like, all right, it's time for you to get promoted. I'm like, I don't want to go work night shift as a sergeant. Uh, that sounds miserable. So I'm going to go <laughs> do my own thing now. And, you know, there's little parts of it that I miss, but overall I never really look back. It's been a, a crazy, crazy journey into doing my own business. And um, honestly, it's been phenomenal. It's been a lot of a lot of fun and very fulfilling to be able to go all over the world now and train everybody from new shooters to, like you said, law enforcement, military, special operations, um, and do that successfully. Now, of course, in this show, we talk all about building a good structure with the rifle. And I asked Joe to describe his structure from the ground up, starting at the feet and literally all the way out to the contact points with the rifle. And this is what he taught us. Um, I think structure is one of the most important things when it comes down to running a rifle and, and having the proper structure behind it will determine whether or not you're going to be able to shoot fast and accurate. And obviously everything that we do is with the goal of um, getting the desired level of accuracy, whatever that is, you know, whether it's a, a three yard target that's wide open or a hundred yard small piece of steel, the desired level of accuracy as soon as possible. That is what I preference every one of my classes with, what I preference every uh, technique and every drill and every piece of gear, that is my goal. And if you keep that goal in the forefront of your mind, it really doesn't matter what your opinion is um, because we always want to compare it against that standard. It's like, does it make me more accurate? Does it make me faster? And can I do it consistently? That's what everything boils down to. So when I look at structure, my goal is that no matter what the distance is, no matter what my target is, I can get behind this rifle effectively to put that desired level of accuracy quickly. You know, one of the things that I like to talk about a lot in structure is the relationship of the upper body and the lower body, specifically the upper body angle. And I was really excited and really pleased when I started to talk to Joe about structure and he dug deep into what that upper body should be doing and more importantly, why it should be doing that. Check this out. When I look at foot placement, honestly, I don't care. And this is something that um, I will say that is a little bit off the, the reservation, um, but I don't care if you put, as a right-handed shooter, traditionally we put left foot forward, right foot back, um, feet shoulder width apart, knees bent. That's all well and good. However, the issue we run into is if we have an array of targets or we're moving, you don't have perfect stance. It's this great for flat range, but I all I care about when I'm setting up for an array of targets or working through a shoot house or anything like that is I want to make sure my center of gravity is forward. And I don't want my feet perfectly online. So obviously you can't quite see my feet here. I'll have them pop up on the hearth. Um, if we have my feet on a center line here, that's not good. I want to have some offset, okay? The goal with that offset is to allow me to shift my hips back and keep my center of gravity forward. And what I look for in this when I'm teaching people is I wanna see their back angle. I can have perfect foot placement and still have a bad stance. And we see this all the time in guys who shoot flat range a lot, where they are driving this left or their, their um, strong side leg back, locking the knee out, bending that and standing up straight. Where I got a lot of my structure is based off of the three gun side of things where I'm shooting 12 gauge. If you have a poor structure, it's going to be pointed out and highlighted real quickly and there's no arguing. When your feet start, your toes start lifting up off the ground when you're taking shots, that means your structure is wrong. Your balance is wrong. 
So pay attention to that. Yes, you can shoot five, five, six, standing one foot, you know, up on your twinkle toes. That's all well and good. But if you want to be able to control it consistently and across platforms, like you said, and then of course, when you add movement to it, we also have to take that into account because yeah, I can, I can stand up right like this, locking that leg out just like so and have good control over it, even shooting a 308 potentially. However, as soon as I start breaking into movement, it becomes extremely inefficient. And I don't want to be putting the pressure on myself to get into this position every time I need to take a shot. I want to be in a position where I can shoot all the time, whether I'm standing static or I'm flowing through a, a stage or a shoot house or anything. So my goal, knees bent, my hips, okay? If you look at this right now, my shoulders are directly above my hips. That is not good. My shoulders behind my hips, that's definitely not good. Right now is where I want to be, which is where my hips are behind my shoulder. My shoulders are in front of my hips. My sternum is in front of my pelvis. Okay, so if I drop a, a plumb line down, it is going down like over my toes here. So that's that's the position I want to see. I want to see my back angled forward. And depending on the difficulty of the platform that we're running, whether it's a you know a comped out you know three gun rifle or a 308 or a 12 gauge, that's going to dictate how aggressive. I create that stance. You know, one of the things that I pay attention to a lot is the stock position on my body. You know, for me, I like to have the stock as centered as possible. But one of the things that I wanted to ask Joe was, and specifically with his clients that might be in law enforcement or the military or civilian defenders that are wearing that plate carrier or vest, how does the contact points of the stock in the body when the vest or plate carrier is in the way affect the overall mount of the rifle. And this is how he taught us. Well, in a minute, we can also pause and I'll grab my vest so we can throw it on there and compare and contrast. Um, actually, no, we can't because my vest is out in the truck. I, I have a spare one that I could potentially throw on and we can we can look at that. But on a, on a slick upper body, um, the goal here is a couple of things. We have four points of contact. Strong hand, okay, that's where I grip the rifle. That is nothing does nothing but operate the controls, safety, trigger, mag release, etc. I'm not pulling with that hand. I'm not driving with that hand. I'm not squeezing the shit out of the gun with that hand. This hand, I could literally hold everything else and just have my finger running the trigger. That's all this hand is for. Um, my support hand is doing a lion's share of the work as far as how I'm putting pressure where it needs to go. Now, the important part of this is where we mount the rifle. And I see a lot of people putting just the toe of the stock on the, on the shoulder. I want to look at biomechanically what is the best place to mount the rifle. I'm actually going to angle my camera up a little bit again so we can go back into uh, getting the upper body squared away. Where is the best place to run this rifle? Now, if I put my hand on my shoulder and I'm standing upright, like we talked about this vertical position, if I have my hand on my shoulder where I want that stock to go, it's angled back, which is where you get that up into the right recoil pattern most of the time. If I shift my hips back and drive that angle of my back forward, like we talked about, if you watch where my, what my hand does, you can actually see what we're creating for the rifle, which is a flat surface for that buttstock to engage with. So instead of being here where we have tip of the buttstock with the shoulder rolled back and it's going over top of our shoulder, if we lean into this, we create a flat surface for this rifle to the, this buttstock to engage with. All right. So a lot of times, like I said, we see this, we're heads up. Yep. I'm not having to bend my neck very far to get behind the optic. Setting up your optic properly will fix that. But if I do this right here, the recoil impulse of the rifle is leveraging over top of my shoulder, which means I have to create more pressure to control it. If I get this down here to at least at the height of my shoulder, even a little bit lower, that's going to be a lot better when we apply this forward lean. So before we talk about how we set up an optic properly, we want to get the structure figured out first, and then we can mount the optic to suit you the best. So when I lock this in here, um, length of stock, how, how, how far your length of pull is, it is somewhat personal preference, but there are some things to keep in mind. When we set this up, I want to make sure that if it's all the way closed, one of the issues that we run into here is we get a really sharp angle with our wrist, and we don't get firm contact with that shoulder. I have to roll that shoulder way too far forward to get good contact with it, okay? And it's really uncomfortable. If we extend it all the way out, which I see some people do, we have a good natural bend to the wrists, okay? This is, this is set up on here, but then 
what happens most of the time is in order for me to get this hand where it needs to be, I end up pushing my shoulder out of engagement. So my shoulder falls back and that's not good either because that starts to rotate our body. We start to see those, that recoil pattern go up to the right. So for me, it's a sweet spot somewhere right about here. This is a, a minimalist stock, the MFT. I have um, my quote unquote work rifle set up. Um, this is a B5 system stock, kind of the same spot. So a little gap here, you know, somewhere in that ballpark is good for most people. I'm 5'10", so not super tall. If you're super tall, you may have a little bit more. If you're shorter and you have you know, shorter arms or you're wearing a lot of kit, then you may need a little bit less. But what I'm looking for with this is if I put my stock in my shoulder and I roll my shoulder into it, okay, not super far where I'm like cramped, but I roll my shoulder into it so it's engaged and I'm pulling back with my left hand, where is this hand ending up? Okay. And this to me is about freaking perfect. Okay. When we talk about recoil management, um, that is entirely accomplished with my, my shoulder, with my strong size shoulder. When I put this rifle in my, in my shoulder, I want to make sure that I'm putting it close to my center line. Obviously, I'm not going to put it right here where I'm like looking down <laughs> the middle of it. I want to have it somewhat off, but I don't want to get onto the ball of the shoulder. And we accomplish that by rolling the shoulder forward to create the pocket for that rifle to sit into. Okay, when I put that into here, you see the buffer tube is uh, lower than my shoulder blade here, the top of my shoulder here. When I put that in here, I can roll that shoulder forward and I can get engage. And the pressure that I dictate with that right shoulder will determine how much recoil I see in my optic. Because the optic is going to dictate what you're doing is whether, whether you, what you're doing is effective or not effective. So I want to apply good pressure here. I want stock position acceptable so I'm not pushing my arms too far out. I'm not having to crunch back in or I'm not getting good uh, contact here and the rifle starts to bounce. And then this hand, my, my left hand in this case, is simply pulling this stock into my shoulder with some pressure. It is not wrenching down. I'm not wrenching on that left hand because my left hand is in charge of aiming. So when I break down every piece of what I'm doing here, right hand runs the gun, runs the controls. Left hand is in charge of aiming. Right shoulder is in charge of recoil management. And then all I want to do with my face is drop it down on the stock. I don't want to be back here. I don't want to be like stretching my neck way far out. I want to remove as much tension as possible in my neck by setting it where it naturally wants to go. If we get this all set up where it needs to be, I just lay down onto the, onto the gun. And I want to have a cheek weld. I don't want to have a, you know, a six inch riser on my gun to where I'm shooting like this. Even, even with nods, it's not great. Um, some riser, if you're going to be running a lot of night vision stuff, yes, there are, are great applications there. But in general, uh, a standard height or maybe a little bit more. I actually come to really enjoy um, the 170 mount, 1.7 inch mount from yep. uh, Badger Ordnance, Condition 1 mount. Uh, I like this height. It's kind of a sweet spot. 193 I find is too high. I'm barely getting the chin weld on it. 150 or 153, whatever it is. Uh, it's a little low, but not bad. I've, I ran those for years. When I found the uh, 170, I'm like, oh, let me try it. And I actually like just kind of that sweet spot where I'm not having to drop my head too low on it. And I'm not also up here where I'm barely getting my chin on, this, on the stock. Man, one of the things that really makes me cringe is that student that has the completely collapsed stock and thinks that they have to touch the charging handle with their nose because some instructor said your nose should be on the charging handle. Maybe for a good reason, maybe that instructor had a good reason to utilize that thought process or communicate that way, but it's obvious to me the student didn't fully understand what they were trying to get across. So I asked Joe about that and uh, this is what he said. When we break things down into a process-based formula, instead of looking at the results and saying, how do we get the results better? It's like, let's look at the process. Step one, where do we put it on our shoulder? Where do we put, put the stock in our, on our body? Step two, where are we applying pressures? Step three, is it working? Okay. And then where do, what does the recoil look like? So like you said, I don't want to pull really hard into my shoulder. I just want to press it in or pull it in a little bit to where it doesn't bounce around. Because if we have it loose in our shoulder, it's going to bounce. If we apply a little bit of pressure, it's not. If we roll that shoulder too far in, you guys can see here, if I roll that shoulder too far in, 
what happens with the muzzle. I push it down right. to the left. Okay. And that's a common situation for me when I have my tuned race gun uh, coming off of like a, a more of a work gun. Um, a lot of times I will overcorrect my recoil by driving that shoulder too far into it. But I can tell you with my work gun, I don't see it going up into the right at all. So bouncing between the two, I have to make some corrections on the pressures that I use. But overall, I, I'm 100% in agreement with you. Getting the, the process broken down in such a way that's bite-sized and actually uh, works is important. So one of the things that I like to say is I have two hands. I have the control hand and I have the working hand, right? The control hand runs the controls the safety, the trigger, or whatever else, the working hand does the work. It grabs the magazine, it works the charging handle, it does all these things. And I wanted to know if Joe fought the same way or taught the same way, and, and in fact he does, and here's what he said. My strong hand, it is holding the gun. Anything else I need to do is working with this hand. You know, the only time I might shift this hand off is when we have to go to, you know, lock the bolt to the rear where we can pull it here, or, you know, I'm gonna hold under and pull it. Either one is fine, um, but otherwise I never, if I see somebody doing some crap like this where they take their, their strong hand and they're, yeah. they're loading the right, like that to yep. me is an automatic sign of this guy doesn't know what they're doing. They, they, they are not comfortable with the weapon. They don't have good training habits and they're not, they don't have a good process for what they're gonna do. And you, you hear it all the time, train how you fight, fight how you train. Some of that's just utter BS, but there is something to be said for doing good reps only. So if I'm gonna do a reload right here, then I want to do all of my loading in the same manner. I don't wanna change just because it's an admin load. I don't wanna to change to some weird crap like this. I'm gonna do it the normal way that I typically would. So this hand controls the rifle, okay? This hand does not. The only time I'm gonna change that up, like you said, there's a couple of situations where we might where we're switching shoulders or um, in competition. If I'm running from right to left, I may take the rifle and run this way to maintain muzzle discipline. Um, but those are very specific circumstances and I train those. I train those separately from my my day-to-day -day regular rifle work. So um, this hand also when we're shooting, it's important that we don't build up a lot of tension. This And I've actually talked to people who they train, pulling that in with your right hand, pulling that into your shoulder and then this hand kind of, you know, your support hand kind of stays loose. I'm like, no, that's, that's all wrong. Cause now you're building all this tension with his arm when this finger has got to be working the trigger with finesse. You know, there, there are key spots of pressure when I'm shooting a rifle as fast as I can. Like the pressure between the stock and my body, the pressure of my strong hand on the grip, the pressure of the lead hand, you know, on the hand guard. And I really wanted to know how Joe, who's a top three gun competitor, as well as a tactical instructor, uh, pressured the rifle. Where does he put the pressure? What does he feel when he shot it? And uh, this is what he told us. My shoulder is designed for recoil control. My left hand is designed to keep it in the shoulder and direct the rifle where it needs to go. So with this hand, it's literally just, just enough grip on here. And, and even when I shoot long range, you know, I'll, I'll shift my thumb out so I don't add any grip to or any squeeze to the grip because that can you know throw a little bit of diversion in my shots so i want to just have enough here this is you know locked into place this hand is pulling it in i like to have some bend to my elbow okay i don't know if you can see this i want to have some bend to my elbow i don't want to have this fully locked out i want to have a, a, a slight bend the bend that i use for my my rifle okay ironically we use this one, I can kind of show a little bit better. But the bend that I use for my rifle right here, if I drop this, is the same place yeah. that I put my pistol, okay? If I transition back, it's the same bend. I'm not changing anything there because it creates this, this uh, consistency across platforms and allows me to do good transitions. And the other thing that I see a lot of times if we lock our elbow out or lock our arm out too far is it pulls our shoulder back, especially when we get into target transitions. If I have this locked back, locked out, my shoulder ends up pulling back because I have to blade my body in order to get the rifle into position because of that arm lock. So playing around with that, um, I look at as far as where we put pressures or how I, how I feel pressures, I wanna make sure that I'm squaring my hips up to the target, squaring my chest up to the target, adding good firm pressure with this shoulder, 
and keeping it that same pressure by pulling slightly back with that left hand, okay? Um, and then the way that I test it is taking a shot and tracking where the dot goes. If the dot's pulling off to the right or it's bouncing a lot, um, I know a lot of people who will see, yeah, consistent up and down recoil, but there's a lot of bounce. And oftentimes that's because they're not actually putting enough pressure into their shoulder. So the rifle, as it recoils, moves against their their pec or their kit or anything like that. It's moving and it's giving it room to, to actually move instead of having a brick wall here. That's the goal. We have a brick wall against this thing. And when it shoots, the rifle is, you know, the, the recoil is absorbed. Um, you can't eliminate recoil, but you can control it. You know, we talked a lot about structure and pressure and the details of mounting the rifle or carbine for speed and accuracy. So one of the things I wanted to know was, what drills did Joe do on the range? How does he work his skills? How does he translate that to specific drills? And this is what he showed us. One of my favorite ones, um, just in consistency, is starting from a low ready or a high ready, snapping the rifle up and shooting one shot on the plate rack, and then shooting two shots, and then shooting three, and that's all six plates. And if you miss one, you have to restart. So it's a consistency drill that's progressive, and it's not about shooting super fast, but it's also not about shooting super slow, because the first shot should set your first shot part-time. So if I come up, and I got a 50-yard plate rack, I snap up, I take one shot, that should be approximately 1 to 1.2 seconds for me. That's where I'm at. Um, I want to maintain that, one, say, 1.1 seconds on my first shot when I go to two shots, okay? And then whatever that split is between shot one and shot two, I want to maintain that and maintain the first shot time for the three shots, the last three plates on the plate rack while still getting my hits. And that is a tough drill. I have done that with pistol. I've done that with rifle. Um, and it is one that will drive you absolutely crazy because yeah. you put a lot of pressure on yourself to make sure you get those hits. And you'd be like, all right, one, good, one, two, good, one, two, miss. You're like, God, dang it. And you got to go down and reset. It. So it does highlight a lot. All right, Joe. So we're going to throw a few rapid fire questions for you and uh, answer them as you may. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, Neil McPollin, shout out to Neil, hopefully that's pronounced right, says, I'm cross-dominant. What can I do to make aiming a rifle easier other than learn to shoot left-handed? So anytime that I have somebody that's cross-eye dominant um, and they're, they're shooting pistol, like, oh my gosh, I'm cross-eye dominant. I'm like, it doesn't matter whatsoever with pistol. You know, the difference with pistol is like right eye, left eye. Uh, no, nothing really changes. With rifle, you have to make a choice. You cannot um, shoot a rifle right-handed with your left eye. Like, this does not work, okay? No. Uh, so, you have to choose, are you going to use your right eye or are you going to shoot left-handed? And that is, it's a personal choice. Now, you'll be surprised that shooting left-handed with rifle does not take as much work as you might think it does. It is something that's actually, with a little bit of effort, a little bit of time, um, and taking away the mental block of, oh my gosh, I can't do anything with my left hand. Uh, you're, you're doing stuff with your left hand, even if you're shooting right-handed. You're still you're controlling out here. You're still doing your reloads. That's all left-handed stuff. It doesn't take a lot of practice to become comfortable shooting left-handed, just like it didn't take you a ton of practice to become shooting, comfortable shooting right-handed. So make a decision. Now, if you do decide to shoot right-handed and you still have uh, you know, a hard time um, overcoming that left eye dominance, you can do something like put a patch over your eye to start practicing with that. You can put a little bit of tape over your glasses to uh, start forcing that right eye to take over some of the dominance. You can actually train your vision. You can train your eyes um, to, to do what you want them to do. Now, it, it does take some work. Um, and some people are cross-eye dominant, but not heavily so. And so they have the ability to kind of switch back and forth between you know, shooting right eye with rifle and shooting left eye with pistol. Um, but I would encourage you to start practicing those things. Now, one thing that I'll tell you, uh, and going back to kind of what we were talking about earlier, is how we set up the, the optics. A red dot's really simple, all right? There's not a whole lot of work to this, but setting up an LPBO or a magnifier, one thing that I can tell you that you definitely want to do, uh, especially getting uh, coming from left eye dominant to right-handed, take the magnifier or your LPBO all the way to max magnification and close your eyes. 
And then when I snap this rifle up, once I get into my shooting position where my shoulders rolled in, my hands are where they need to be, I want to open my eyes. And right now I have a perfectly clear field of view. I don't have any shadowing. I don't have any tunneling. If you open your eyes and you have all this tunneling or shadowing from side to side, uh, you probably need to adjust where your optic is mounted. That's why it's important to get your structure correct first. Um, and then as far as, you know, coming from left, left eye dominant, that's where, you know, being able to open your eyes and have your right eye take on the task of seeing through that optic is going to help you a lot. I couldn't agree more. And as a matter of fact, I'm cross dominant as well. And for me, I know that when my stock touches my right cheek, my right eye is going to take over. When my stock touches my left cheek, my left eye is going to take over. So great answer, Joe. Uh, okay. Uh, Neil Barra, shout out to Neil. Hello, Neil. Says, shooting on the move with a pistol versus a carbine slash PCC. Is it possible to do both at the same speed and accuracy? What do you think? That's a good question. Um, I think, is it possible? Yes, it, it is possible. I think that uh, a rifle is always going to be a little bit more accurate because you do have more points of contact. You have a longer sight radius, all of these different things that are going to help you shoot um, accurately. A pistol is obviously a more difficult platform to master, but can it be done? Yes, it can be done. Um, shooting on the move really is... Uh, dictated by your lower body. And I think lower body having that squared away is more important. You know, my upper body structure and presentation doesn't change when I shoot on the move. Everything is the exact same. It's what am I doing with my lower body? And that's where you're going to be able to excel in shooting on the move is uh, keeping your feet a little bit closer together, keeping your knees bent, keeping your stance leaned forward into it so that, you know, we're not standing upright to shoot on the move. We're leaning even more into that position. Um, and then, you know, how we place our feet as we as we take those steps i think that's that's what makes the real difference um one issue that you might see with the rifle is as you're breathing and you're shooting on the move you have a little bit more rotation in your shoulders versus pistol where you can kind of let that balance in front of you um but otherwise like getting good at shooting on the move requires you shooting on the move i, I don't it, it, can you dry fire yes and i do have dry fire drills that i run to help with shooting on the move um, but to truly get good at shooting on the move, there is no substitution for actually getting out and seeing where the round's impacting when you take that shot and expect to get a hit. Because if it's not there, then you're doing something wrong. Oh, yeah, I agree. Good answer. Yeah, I agree. It, it, is, it is certainly possible, assuming we're following all the same fundamentals, right? Good, good, good answer. So, all right, let, let's see what else we have. Oh, here we go. Uh, Chronicles of Aces and Alphas. That's a cool name, Chronicles. Shout out to Chronicles. Uh, what's the biggest difference in footwork with shooting a PCC versus a pistol? Um, I wouldn't say there's really any difference in the footwork. I would, I would say that the, the foot placement, again, the placement of your feet don't, doesn't matter as long as you're you know, putting them offset a little bit. Um, it's center of gravity and how we present it. Otherwise, the footwork is the same. I don't think that there's, to me, there's no difference. Yeah, interesting. I, I, uh, I didn't know how you would answer that, but I, I think I agree. I think the footwork is very similar. Of course, the rifle or PCC has multiple points of contact. Handgun doesn't, but uh, agreed. All right, uh, one more. This is from Tom George. Shout out, Tom. What is the best way to position yourself around obstacles to get on target? I'm having issues with the wall type when the target is tight to the inside of the wall system. So I would assume he's meaning, you know, you got the right edge of the wall or the left edge of the wall, they're barricaded, and you got to shoot hard around it to get to that target. So what are your thoughts on that? That is one of the hardest things to do with a carbine or a rifle is getting those hard leans. I'll tell you in the, the Ipsic world, uh, like that match I shot in Poland, there were some really, really awkward positions where um, it, it's even leaning, you know, kneeling. I put one on my story on, on Instagram yesterday uh, showing where I had a lean on both sides, left side and right side in a hard kneel position. Um, but one of the biggest keys that I can recommend for any hard lean left or right is if you're gonna lean to the left, I'm sorry, if you're going to lean to the right, put your right foot forward and open up your stance with that left foot. So let me bring this down a little bit so we can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, if I open this up, you can see 
Uh, as I lean to the right, I'm going to lead with that left, that right leg. I'm going to bend that knee and lean forward because one of the big issues I see is people either coming online or they lead with their left foot and they bend backwards to come around the barricade. Okay. Same thing going left. If I'm going to lean to the left, I want to get as much bend in that knee leaning forward as I go around the left side barricade. Now shooting carbine, PCC, or um, you know, pistol caliber carbine, or even a rifle in open division, I run an offset red dot. So that allows me to get a little bit extra lean while keeping this vertical before I have to go and invert that elbow or switch to left-handed. And if I am gonna go left-handed, the same rule applies. I still lean into that left knee like so. Okay, I don't know if you can see that well, but that's what I'm looking for. I still wanna maintain the um, back angle. So we're still controlling the recoil. I still wanna maintain the uh, offset on my feet and keep that center of gravity forward. All right, Joe, you knocked it out of the park, man. Great answers as always, uh, I love it. You opened my eyes to a few things. I know I'm gonna to go to the range and I'm gonna put some of this stuff to the test and work on some of those things that you covered specifically. Uh, Joe, where do people find out more about you? Tell them about your website. I know you have a dry fire program online. Tell them about your dry fire program, where you're gonna be teaching. Tell them about your social media. Where can people find you? So next couple months, um, I've got uh, multi-gun nationals up in Wisconsin. That's gonna be in July. I've got a, a special operations class or, or a course competition that I'm doing in a couple of weeks. I'm getting getting prepped for that now, uh, going back to the three gun world, which I love. Um, and that's up in North Carolina. And then um, I'm doing some classes here and there. So next weekend, I've got a pistol class. But uh, the dry fire program is one of my big things that I've been been working on for years. And I'm actually getting ready to release a competition handgun version of that. So we have the dry fire mastery. Uh, multi-gun mastery we have handgun foundations which is for uh, newer or you know even up to intermediate shooters i wouldn't say like competition based already no stay at you, you don't necessarily need that but it's focused on building a good foundation with your handgun and then of course multi-gun mastery that's a a 30-day course that is giving you everything that you need to get good at three gun and that's it's focused primarily on on um, shotgun with a tube fed shotgun but we also have some open open shotgun uh, modules in there too. And we got some more coming for that. But I also have the dry fire crew, which is the community uh, where I'm posting weekly content, um, longer form videos, stuff like this, where we're talking about more in depth training content, where we can bounce ideas and, and questions off of. Uh, this week, we have t-shirts coming, um, which is going to be kind of a short, short launch. That'll be only available for like a week. So if you guys want any of that stuff, you can follow me on, on the socials. You can hit me up on my email uh, or go to the websites. It's farewellfirearms.com or dryfiremastery.com. And there you have it, folks. Joe Farewell. Give him a follow on Instagram. Trust me, I do. You're going to learn a ton. Check out his website. Check out that Dry Fire program. Um, if you have the opportunity, take one of his classes. I guarantee you're going to have a great time and you're going to learn a ton. So thank you so much for joining me on the Live Fire Show. Don't forget to give me a follow as well on Instagram. If you are on Live Fire, and I certainly hope that you are, send me a message and give me a follow there. And guess what? You get to see my programming and I will see your programming and maybe add a couple comments. And if you need some help, that's what I'm there for, folks. So take the material we talked about in today's show and put it to practice, put it to use, right? Because if you don't do the work, nothing happens. So get out there and work with that rifle or carbine, whatever you're shooting. And until then, train hard. <laughs>